Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. Tonight, I have with me my co-host, Clayton Jones. Good evening. Clay. Doing good. And we're honored tonight to have with us Joe Roche, who claims to be an activist and who's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on in downtown Houston tonight. But uh, first, we do have a little bit of news, and I thought I'd start the news on the lighter side with a report about a new brand of candy that is hitting shelves across the country and creating some consternation among some parents. This candy is called Pothead. It's molded in the shape of a marijuana leaf. The example I saw on TV was a bright green color and in a sour apple flavor. The manufacturer says that it's just plain good candy, but he's trying to push the idea of legalizing marijuana. There have been a few parents that have objected, claiming that this will lure their kids into using marijuana. So I looked around. I haven't seen any stores here in Houston yet, but you might keep your eyes out for some pothead and see if it's decent candy or just a gimmick. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I'll come back to this later with some other things, is some of you might know that... Uh, the White House has instituted a website, and anybody can post a petition on this website. People can go on the website and sign the petition, and the White House has promised a formal response to any petition that gets at least 25,000 signatures. When they started out, it was at least 5,000 signatures, but the tax and regulate marijuana like wine hit the 5,000 limit within a matter of hours, <laughs> so the rule was changed. It's now 25,000. Uh, interestingly, and this list is several days ago, but <clears throat> when I last checked, there were about a dozen of the petitions that have been filed uh, release all known beneficial information regarding cannabis, hemp, marijuana, and its derivatives. Uh, stop denying the medical value of cannabis, marijuana. Remove it from Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act. Remove marijuana from the Schedule 1 list of drugs in the Controlled Substances Act. Allow United States disabled military veterans access to medical marijuana to treat their PTSD. Eliminate or reform departments whose officers are required by law to lie to the American people. Uh, pardon Jason Spires with a number. An Illinois inmate serving a 30-year and now in the ninth year sentence on a marijuana charge. Repeal any and all laws pertaining to the illegalization of the cannabis plant and all of its uses. Pardon Mark Emery. Give states the freedom to establish their own marijuana laws. Repeal any and all laws pertaining to the illegalization of the cannabis plant and all of its uses. Allow industrial hemp to be grown in the U.S. once again. In the destructive, wasteful, and counterproductive war on drugs. Stop interfering with state medical marijuana legislative efforts. Legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana. Uh, and there are probably more, but that's the list I've got. Have you heard anything about these, Clayton? No, I, I've uh, been seeing them on the web. Yeah. Um, but no, I haven't seen any of the numbers. I've been way too busy. Okay. Uh, it's at uh, www.whitehouse.gov slash blog 
And uh, that will let you look at any of them and sign any of them you're interested in. When I first thought about it, I thought, gee, we need to have maybe two or three, one on hemp, one on medical marijuana, one on legalization, and concentrate our efforts. And then I got to thinking, no, I think maybe it's better to give the politicians the idea of what's going on if they're faced with this broad spectrum of all sorts of different people saying similar things. But uh, it's kind of interesting, and this is probably a good time to bring Joe into the conversation because uh, you've been in downtown Houston trying to get the government's attention on some matters <laughs> right now. Started in uh, Wall Street, what, nearly two weeks ago now? Um, Occupy Wall Street, um, uh, really, the, the there's a newspaper, the Occupy Wall Street Times, that no. they've printed up, and I'm sorry, Professor, I didn't bring a copy for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they claim uh, 17th September as their okay. official date. It started really gaining steam about three weeks ago. And how did it spread from there to Houston? Um, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I, I joined uh, this past Thursday. Um, but to answer how did it spread uh, from there to here, I would imagine uh, social media played a okay. big role in that, specifically Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and I will talk some more about that in a little bit because uh, more and more Facebook and Twitter are sinking into my old head even a little bit on <laughs> political action. Uh, so what are the people in Houston doing downtown? Um, just, just to be clear, I'm not an official spokesperson I for Occupy Houston. I understand that, there, that this yeah. is an unorganization <laughs> with unspokesmen and yeah. no we, hierarchy at all. We, we pass ourselves off as a leaderless group. Um, okay. What are we doing in yeah. Houston? Um, we're occupying. Okay. And uh, I've been there for going on a week. Yeah. Uh, for most of that time, uh, we, we, well, we were at um, Eleanor Tinsley. Uh, now we're back at what I call the reflecting pool in okay. front of City Hall, okay. which is Herman Park. Right. Uh, there's several dozen folks are camping out there um, throughout the day. Uh, we have meetings and marches. A uh, good number of us marched down to the Mickey Leland Federal Building today. Okay. Um, and as you know from the mainstream media... I understand media, Senator Hutchinson wasn't just too pleased to see you. You know, I, didn't, I don't know. I didn't get to an opportunity <laughs> to meet with her. I couldn't, I couldn't enter the building because there were several hundred people, protesters, in yeah. front of me. Okay, and uh, I understand several, a lot of policemen were there today. Several hundred? Uh, yes, Clayton. Um, I would say it was about, it looked like about 400. Uh, the uh, Barnacle, or Chronicle, excuse me, said uh, 200. So yeah. many hundreds of folks there. There was a just in a huge um, presence of uh, local law enforcement and, mm -hmm. and, of course, the FBS, the Federal Protective Service as yeah. well. Every time I've been down there on different things, they come out in force. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what has impressed me nationwide, and this apparently really is nationwide now, uh, is not only the stick to it mm -hmm. people hanging around forever and ever and yeah. ever, but uh, the really extreme orderliness the lack of violence, the lack of, of law-breaking of any kind. And I think, to give credit to credit, where credit is due, on the other side, overall, the restraint the police have shown in most instances. Mm -hmm. I mean, the police went wild at least one day in New York. And mm -hmm. There were some arrests at the Mickey Leland building today, as I understand. Yes, and, and keep in mind, those uh, Occupy Houston wasn't formally endorsing that event, right. uh, although there was a large number of us from Occupy Houston, the yeah. occupiers, 
uh, that were there. Um, well, well, let me ask you this. How do you distinguish an Occupy Houstoner from a non occupy You know, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's, there's a guy that hijacks protests, and he was standing out um, uh, yesterday and today with a very large sign that says homosexuality is a sin. He's not occupying, and we put up a, uh, put a counter protest yeah. to him with some very unkind words on signs, which yeah. uh, we were told to take down. But the peacefulness of it on the large part, um, I'm impressed yeah. uh, on both our part, on Occupy Houston's part, and uh, local law enforcement's part, yeah. on HPD's part. There's been good rapport and good communication. Um, and there's there's been some known activists like Ray Hill, yeah. uh, who's who's shown up many times. We we do have legal observers from the National Lawyers Guild, okay. um, who wear the uh, fluorescent uh, green hats. Randy Callanan, a big civil rights yeah. attorney, has been there. Um, but we respect uh, most of the little laws, such as there's currently a, a ban ordinance uh, or a burn ban on fires in the city parks. Right, yeah. We didn't have a barbecue in Eleanor Tinsley. It's an yeah. executive order from the mayor out of a drought. Mm -hmm. We generally don't uh, smoke cigarettes there. I haven't yeah. seen, um, you know, anyone using their medical marijuana uh, in the city parks. Yeah. Well, that's. That's nice to hear. It really is. And among other things, I was impressed on the first night that this took place uh, with the mayor's statements when she said uh, about the park that the deed of gift to the city says we can't shut it down at night. Uh, no one will be allowed to put up tents or anything else, but we can't keep them from being here. Uh, I thought it was a rather moderate, well-nuanced response on her part. Yeah, yeah. They they were kind to us uh, this weekend, even at Eleanor Tinsley, when it rained hard. Yeah. Um, we just went ahead and erected tents uh, for shelter from the rain, both yeah. canopies, and there was some uh, great, uh, great tents, great, great yeah. shelter from the rain. Um, can we put up tents at Eleanor Tinsley right now? Um, there are tents there. There's, yeah. there's canopies well, right now, there. Well, now, Tinsley is different. Or, or no, uh, at, at, at yeah. Reflecting Pool. Can we yeah. put up the tents right now in Herman Square at the Reflecting Pool? That's in debate. There yeah. are tents right now. Those tents have a permit. What we're doing is more important than a permit. We are exercising our freedoms. <laughs> it sounds to me like there is a whole lot of First Amendment going on. Mm-hmm. Rights of assembly, rights to petition, rights, freedom of speech, uh, just First Amendment all over the place out there. Yeah, definitely, it is. So, uh, even though I know it's not organized, there are no official position, are there any particular grievances that seem to be more widespread or more common than others? Um, there, there is a grievance that's very widespread, and that's how um, the media, specifically the mainstream media, is portraying us um, as anarchists. Uh, there were a couple of gentlemen out uh, this past weekend that do self-identify as anarchists. Uh, there's a few people um, that identify that uh, as that. Um, and anarchy is a bad word, uh, especially <laughs> when it's on Fox News. <laughs> um, it, well, the, the problem with anarchy is that if you're an anarchist, it's really hard to get organized. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that. Even we, uh, two of our anarchists left during the General Assembly yeah. because they couldn't take it. Um, but in addition to that, there's, there's other folks there just for their, their own reason or their own candidate. There's a presidential candidate who's a medical doctor down south of here. Um, and it, there's been a contingent of, of folks who support him, but there's, they're not complaints about um, this is the type of candidate I support. Um, on the large part, uh, we are the, uh, you know, we are Occupy Houston. We um, are looking for a democratic uh, end to, to, to corporate corruption as, yeah. as we know it. We're the 99%. We, we don't have lobbyists. Well, 
99% of the people piled up in one place makes a pretty effective <laughs> yeah. uh, And as I say, I want to talk about that a little bit later tonight. Uh, well, what about responses from the man on the street or the woman on the street? Um, it's been great. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, uh, this evening, uh, when we had uh, just a significantly smaller march down to Exxon Mobil's building, um, we just said, you know, check out our website, occupyhouston.org. Um, it's been peaceful. Uh, occasionally, uh, you get someone drives by in a car, gives you a one finger salute. Um, we stay responsible and don't acknowledge that or confront them. Um, you know, folks are interested in it. They yeah. stop and look at the signs. Um, a response today, I, I don't know if you know, in, in town there's a convention. Uh, they were at the George R. Brown Convention Center, and they, they let out for lunch and came over to the farmer's market at City Hall. And that convention yeah. is Texas Municipal League, and it was a whole bunch of elected city council people, right. alder men, alder people, oh. mayors from throughout Texas, from, from Odessa, from uh, mm. McAllen. And they, they did stop and, and read our signs. One of them uh, had uh, a dissent uh, in... And as a matter of fact, it was an elected official, the mayor pro temp from Cedar Park told us it was un-American what we were doing, anti-American. <laughs> and so our response to that professor was just we broke out in one of our chants, and I forget if it was we are the 99%, and that's it. And, 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 and you know, it just mitigated the situation, and he kept walking. <laughs> Gee, I would have been tempted to quote him something about the rights of the people to assemble and petition. I, I, I don't think he had that intelligence capacity, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one thing that's impressed me, and this I guess is much from what I've seen on TV about what's going on in New York, mm -hmm. is the way that there has been, I don't want to say spontaneous organization, but spontaneous action to take thing, care of things like sanitation and trash cleanup and food and water distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been really amazing to me about how this totally without organization assembly has been able to function as a community. Definitely, definitely. The, specifically on the sanitation part, um, I, I like to call it the sustainability. We have a sustain, sustainability um, committee that donated, or, or somebody donated, uh, uh, large recycle bins. There's one for plastic, one for paper, cans, mm -hmm. glass. Um, in this crowd, on, on, you occupy Houston in large part. We're, we're a little bit aware of environmental issues and, yeah. and look after that. As far as cleaning up the rubbish, the trash, um, we want to do our part and not litter in that city park, you yeah. know? Um, uh, this is a good time for me to interrupt and to remind the viewers that this is a call-in show. This is your show. We won't hear from you. The phone number's on the screen. If you're watching live, if you're watching on YouTube or streaming video, you can leave a question or comment by emailing me at the address shown, and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. We might have your comment or question on the next show. Uh, I thought that this was an appropriate time to uh, suggest to some of the people out there watching that they might like to let us know what they think about what's going on. Well, you've been apparently around and observing some of this. Clayton. Yeah, I've been down there uh, seeing things going on. I've, the democratic process they do is, uh, it would be a little bit slow for me. I mean, um, they expect people to follow the rules, and they do. Um, I'm very, I was surprised. I was surprised today when I went down there and moved from, Tinsley Park to the... Uh... Yeah. Well, as I say, that surprised me all across the country. Uh, I honestly cannot think of any other mass gathering in 
recent history that has gone on for this long as peacefully as this has gone on without riots breaking out, without rocks being thrown, mm -hmm. without tear gas being turned loose, without fire hoses. <laughs> uh, I mean, on, on both sides. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I guess it, it boils down to, it seems to me, just from watching that there's a hell of a lot of respect for everyone being shown there. A lot of restraint held by everybody. I, I was impressed today. The, 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 there is. Um, you know, HPD has, has been respectful. We've been respectful to, to them on a large part. Well, more than that, respectful yeah. of each other. Yes, yes, of each other. Um, you know, you had asked about uh, also the food earlier. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Hi. A um, couple of things. Okay. One is about the petitions um, that you mentioned early in the program. Yes. Um, it's a good thing if people can register for that site. There are a number of them dealing with both hemp and cannabis. Yes. Um, and they have a criteria. I think the number of signatures required is either five or ten thousand. I'm not sure what. Which means that at that level, then it will, then the White House will take a look at it and uh, respond. They've upped that to twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand. Yeah, okay. okay. And the one that normal, uh, the national normal um, submitted already has the number that they need. So and it's got it's surpassed that. The other thing that's interesting, I read today, and I don't have the resource, I need to go out and look for it, was that Judge Scalia, of all on the Supreme Court, said that the um, expanding the drug war was just useless and it was a terrible use of our um, resources. So that might be something you want to look for, I'll look <laughs> into a little bit further, I know I'm going to. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And I might also add, before we get away from it, uh, I mentioned those petitions that uh, referred directly to the drug laws, but uh, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of different petitions. So no matter what your interests are, there's probably at least one up there that uh, you might be willing to join in with. So take a look at it. So do you think uh, our president will uh, have, once he has 25,000, be stumped again on what to say on uh, medical marijuana, <laughs> as he was in the last... Uh... You know, he's had, what, two years to think about his first answer, and I suspect he'll, be, he'll do a better job this time. But, you know... I think we need to be keeping pressure on, but I don't really think we want to see any federal action for the next 13 months. That until this next election takes place, anything that Congress would try to do is just going to go down the drain like everything else. It's, this is, I would say, without a doubt, the worst, most poorly performing, ineffective, ineffectual Congress I have ever seen in a long lifetime of looking at politics. Now, see, I, that's where we're coming back to my opinion. I, I honestly say that if they're up for election this time, Vote them out. No incumbents. Uh, even if half the Congress is brand new, they can't well, do any worse than what they're doing now. Uh, if you look at the freshman Republicans in the House of Representatives, would you still say that? I'd say that no matter who. <laughs> I would say that if, even if it was all Republican because what we have isn't working. Yeah. And I think if you really cleaned house on one election, I think the rest of them would stand up yeah. and start doing what we expect them to do. Yeah. Well, uh, 
<laughs> it's, a, it's a thought, and it's a nice thought. Uh, I want to talk with both of you guys about a thought I have had about helping make democracy work uh, when we get to the second half of the show. But this might be a good time to do the weekly book review. And tonight, you get a two-for-one treat. <laughs> we have Howard Campbell, Drug War Zone, and El Sicario, which is edited by uh, Molly Malloy and Charles Madden. And I've put the two together because they really complement each other. Professor Campbell is an anthropologist at the UTEP and has taken an ethnological approach to the drug culture in and around Juarez. It includes extensive interviews with drug traffickers, police and government officials, journalists, and just ordinary people caught up in the mess together with Professor Campbell's comments. El Sicario is really the transcript from a documentary film in which a professional assassin working for one of the El Paso cartels manages to get loose from them, has a religious conversion experience, straightens his life around, and gives an extended interview to the film producer, uh, which becomes an award-winning documentary film. Uh, the strange picture on the cover, through the whole movie, El Sicario, the Assassin, was interviewed with a black veil over his head so that he could not be identified. Um, the two together paint a very disturbing experience of what's been going on uh, in the El Paso area in particular, uh, Mexico in general, and paint what I think most people would find to be a rather alarming and disturbing picture of corruption and narco influence within the Mexican government. But uh, those of us living as close to the border as we do, I think have an obligation to find out more about what's going on around us. These two eminently readable books are a good place to start. And I believe it's about time. Are we taking a break at this time or not? Okay. Oh, we've been talking to Joe Roche about Occupy Houston. We've mentioned earlier the uh, White House website for petitions, read off a list of a dozen having to do with drug laws. There was a brief news announcement earlier this week, unfortunately without enough details, where the chair of the Texas Legislative Senate Committee on Business and Commerce announced that within a week or two, his committee could accept real-time comments from the general public from things like Twitter through cloud sourcing. Uh, he wasn't clear about how it worked. I suspect he's a bit of a technical behind-the-times type. I don't know whether it's limited to just his committee or the whole legislature. don't know how it works. But it made me start thinking about something. And with that tease, we'll take a break. And when I come back, I'll present you with my great idea. The whole idea of a drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? 
So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk about. I'm going to start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference on whether people use drugs or not. Al Al yeah. Alcohol didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. Well, so there's this unholy spirit that's between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. The war on drugs uh, isn't working, and that, uh, if anything, is just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. This is Dean Becker of the Drug Truth Network. I urge you to listen to our programs on KPFT Radio, that's 90.1 FM in Houston, and available on the net at drugtruth.net. And the reasons why, there is no truth, no justice, no logic, no scientific fact, no moral clarity, no reason whatsoever for this drug war to continue. And it's going to take your involvement, and I urge you to become part of that solution. Today. We're back. Welcome again to Drugs, Crime, and Politic. Clayton Jones and I welcome Joe Roche, who's been talking to us about uh, Occupy Houston. I got a note during the break that. Uh, Tomorrow night on A&E, there will be a reality series show, Border Town, Laredo and the Narcs. It will be on at 9 o'clock Central on A&E, Border Town, Laredo. So uh, you might watch it and see what's happening. Anyway, what I was thinking about before the break and was leading up to it with being able to Twitter your representatives with online petitions at the White House with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, occupying Wall Street, Boston, Atlanta, Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, there are LA 25, occupy 25 everywhere. Cities. That uh, maybe it's time to see if we couldn't democratize our government. <laughs> We've had C-SPAN following what happens in Congress for quite a while. But C-SPAN is such 1960s technology. <laughs> They've got one channel and one of it follows the House, the other follows the Senate. I got to thinking today, what Congress needs, and probably what the state legislature needs, is a congressional Facebook. Every member of Congress should have a page on that Facebook. Every time he or she opens their mouths to make a comment of any kind, either in congressional meetings, our political speech, or at a high school football honors dinner, those comments should be posted on their page, and anyone in the United States should be allowed to respond with their own comments. That's for every member of Congress. And then for each committee of both houses, that committee should have a page as well. Every hearing that committee has, the full hearing of the committee should be posted. Anyone should be allowed to make comments and post them for all of the world to see. Can you imagine the effect it would have on a member of Congress we know of, of some entertainment figures that have followers of a half million or a million. Uh, 
I don't think there will ever be a congressman as popular as Lady Gaga. But think what would happen to your congressman if he made some sort of silly speech and 30 minutes later looked and 10,000 people had made a comment about it and all of those 10,000 comments could be read by everybody else in the country. I think that we might start approaching truly representative government at very, very little cost. <laughs> <laughs> at least at no cost to anything except the egos and securities of some elected representatives. So, <laughs> am, am I just going off track here completely, guys? No, I think you got a damn good idea. Mm -hmm. I strongly, I strongly agree mm -hmm. with that. The only con I can think of is the, the comments might look like the Chronicles website's comments from time to time, but the... <laughs> well, you know, there's one nice thing about civilization. Over the course of the last 20 or 30,000 years, we have all developed pretty good devices for straining out and throwing away the bullshit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can go through those comments yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I've, I've, I learned a new word about a week ago. I'm just looking for a chance to use it. Uh, I heard the word frass, F-R-A-S-S. -S. I had never heard this word before. But apparently it means insect excrement. <laughs> and it looks to me like it should be very useful to refer to things that, that aren't important enough even to be called chicken shit. <laughs> 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 and a lot of congressional comments probably fit in that area. Mm. So. <laughs> well, uh, what else has been going on, Clayton? Well, you? California's... Uh it's been front and center. Yeah. It started about two weeks ago. The, the government sent out some uh, notices to tell your tenants to get out because they're in the marijuana yeah. industry. And they uh, came out and they started forfeiture a week ago on four different yeah. places. And they say that they are going to do a complete... Um, shaking up of California's uh, marijuana industry. They're going to close all the dispensaries. They're going to uh, close the commercial grows. Mm -hmm. They're going to start at around schools first, and they're going to branch out from there. They're going to get all the confectionery companies, shut them down, mm -hmm. shut down the uh, dispensaries, and the commercial growers. Wonderful. No, it isn't wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. Because it's an overreaction. Oh, yes. You know, if the government had been as smart as it looked like they were going to be, when Attorney General Holder said, we're going to leave state medical marijuana alone, then things would have rocked along pretty peacefully. But what has happened has been that this later reaction to the boom in state medical marijuana activity is an overreaction, and it's getting people upset. I mean, I, I read the news stories coming out of California and I'm not finding any that say, hooray for the U.S. attorneys, let's get on with it. No. Local law enforcement are saying that. Uh, Some of them, not even all. Not no. all of them, no. That's, that's been one of the things that's intrigued me, and this, this is both in California and Washington State, has been that for the first time, I'm seeing a real split with... Yes. A substantial minority of law enforcement people saying, hey, come on, this isn't so bad, it's working, let's stick with it. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, there's West Coast, 
their attitude is very much different than what it is here in Texas. Yeah. Law enforcement, I mean, mm -hmm. out there, they're, it seems like they have a little more open-mindedness. Well, they're willing to listen and learn. <laughs> Back in the days when I was a kid growing up in Texas, California was called the left coast. And the joke was that if you pick America up by the eastern seaboard and shake it, all of the loose nuts went rolling down to California. So, uh, you know, California, probably more than any place in the country, has been a collection of the people that don't fit anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's had to, to, to develop a more tolerant attitude. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hello? Uh, hello. Yes, you're on the air. Do you have a comment or question? I had a comment. Um, I just wanted to, well, first of all, say thanks for uh, bringing awareness to um, the drug laws and um, and advocating against them because, uh, and, and I just wanted to give you a little example. Uh, my sister um, had a son. He was about 17, uh, going on 18, and she lived in Texas outside of Houston, Alvin, yeah. and uh, he was just getting into uh, nothing that any other teenager would do. <coughs> police were basically, uh, you know, uh, cracking down on us, uh, and, and yeah. she, she kind of foresaw that because um, he likes to smoke pot, that uh, if uh, the way the state is, it basically just locks people up uh, for anything, okay, um, and they make money off of it. It's big, you know, it's a yeah. big institution in mm. itself, so she just basically, uh, with her son, agreed to get out of here, and they did go to California. Um, and they're now living in Humboldt County, which is uh, right near Fort Bragg, California. And... Uh, she told me since then that out there, basically, um, uh, marijuana is legal. There's a lot of dispensaries, and uh, there's a lot of overflow. Okay. I can and, see where you're going. Uh, thank you. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, and she, uh, she basically out there, you know, there's no crime. It, it's a total different atmosphere. As a matter of fact, right. even uh, when she first got there, they were basically on the street, and, and they even take care of the homeless out there. Um, you don't have to, like, have an address to get a meal. It, okay. It's just, the state is just uh, so backwards, and, uh, you know, it all starts uh, with the leadership. Okay. So okay. Uh, consider that when you're considering Rick Thank Perry you. and all that, you know. So I just Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to correct one thing you said. It, marijuana is not legal in, in California. No. But it does have a much more open... Uh, tolerant, accepting society than, than large parts of the country. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not just California. Uh, we've seen the same really open, rapid acceptance uh, in Washington State and Colorado as well. Uh, and we need to take another short break and come right back. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, I remember just going in, taking a small area of my community and for all practical purposes, cordoning it off, uh, completely cleaning it up, using some pretty sophisticated techniques, uh, trampling all over the edges of the Constitution to do so. But I mean, really cleaning it up and getting all of the dope that was out of there. And to my dismay, 90 days later, uh, I had had a Haitian group to move in from downstate. Uh, I had the Miami boys to move in from Jacksonville. And they were shooting machine guns and beating people mercilessly. And, and I wanted my old dope dealers back. <laughs> Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, I'm Buford Terrell. I'm here with Clay Jones and uh, Mr. Roach. And there was another bit in the news this week that I think we need to pay attention to. Uh, the State Jails Commission pulled a surprise visit on the Harris County lockup and found them to be out of compliance with state jail standards because they had too many people there and substantially fewer staff members than the state standards call for for the number of prisoners they had. And Houston has had problems with jail overcrowding for many years now. Uh, they're renting jail space in Louisiana. They tried to get a referendum to, for bonds to build a new jail several years ago. That voted down. It got voted down by the people. What I do not understand is that the state legislature several years ago gave cities like Houston legal relief from this act that should free up a lot of jail space and has the potential of saving millions of dollars in operating expense. Under state law, if the city of Houston wants to, they can issue citations like traffic tickets to people stop for misdemeanor, nonviolent crimes that would be primarily marijuana possession and some minor theft offenses. Checks. They do not take them to jail. They have to promise to appear in court. It also requires that the judges grant them personal recognizance bond unless good cause is shown otherwise. There are over 50,000 marijuana arrests in Texas each year. If Houston has its proportional part, that's about 12,000 here each year or 1,000 a month, and at 30 bucks a day, even if that 1,000 a month just stays overnight in jail before going to the court, think how much money can say, be saved just by using the state law that already exists. Philadelphia does that exact same thing already. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Okay. Uh, when a police officer is accused of uh, misconduct or misbehavior or maybe being in, investigated by internal affairs, do you yes. think that maybe his background or you know, his drug test should be made public? Like, the, uh, for instance, the officer who investigated the traffic accident of the other officer with the alcohol, and they covered that up. Okay. That's a good question. Um, I think that a police officer accused of misconduct or of a criminal violation should be entitled to exactly the same rights as anyone else accused of a criminal violation. In other words, there if a criminal complaint has been filed, then sooner or later 
the evidence in that criminal complaint becomes public. If it's merely an investigation for a violation of a departmental regulation that does not involve the rights of a citizen, uh, then the same sort of confidentiality would apply that would apply to you if your boss started looking to see whether you'd been stealing paper clips. So, you know, policemen don't give up all of their rights when they become policemen. But most of what they do should be subject to public scrutiny. And most of the time, believe it or not, you're entitled to go down and under open records, get copies of almost any police record there is. And if it's the kind of thing that shows up in any kind of report like that, it should be available just like any other public record. So. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about Arkansas? Now they just arrested 70 law enforcement officers in Arkansas? No, I must have missed that one. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they were taking from uh, the evidence room. Oh, I remember, yes, reading something yes, about Yes, uh, 70 law enforcement officials. Yeah. Uh, this, this was all connected to one very, very large cocaine bust, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. And several tons involved, and at least 70 officers were, were taking bits of this evidence stash, either for personal use or to sell to someone else. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. At least those are the allegations. It's still under investigation. Yeah. Well, they've arrested 70 so yeah. far, so it's... It's still an allegation <laughs> until the very <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, after all, some people are found innocent. Especially if uh, the best defense you can have is having a um, political uh, person for a parent. Like a congressman, if your parents are congressman, that's a good defense <laughs> uh, on possession charges. It's always worked in the past. Well, it's, it's worked pretty well also on DWIs, and it, not just politicians. One thing that, and actually I would say our legal system is probably better on this than it has ever been throughout history is that the rich and powerful and connective, connected have always gotten a better deal. Of course. It's probably less true today than at any time in our history. And I think that it's getting better as time goes by. Wait, we wait. actually have sent some Congress people to prison recently. W what about our... Um, uh county judge uh, that just resigned. He spent a million dollars on his defense mm -hmm. and he got a sweetheart a deal. Commissioner. Yes. Well, Never solved. Frankly, uh, that's the kind of sweetheart deal that I suspect almost anyone with a decent lawyer could have gotten. He's going to do about four years in prison. He pleaded guilty to in effect, obstruction of justice. Uh, they agreed not to pursue the charges about whether or not he was uh, letting buddies have county contracts. But those are exactly the same sorts of deals that, that you see every day at all levels of the criminal justice system. That one's not a rich guy gets a better deal. <coughs> That's, you know, 40 years ago, when I was a baby lawyer starting out, like most baby lawyers, I would take just almost anything <laughs> to earn mm -hmm. a fee, which meant I did quite a bit of traffic ticket defense. One gimmick that a lot of us used at the time was if a client got a traffic ticket, we'd tell them don't go pay it, 
wait, they'll issue you another ticket for failure to appear. Then I'll plead you guilty on the failure to appear. They'll dismiss the speeding ticket. You pay the fine, but nothing goes on your driver's record and your insurance. Anybody gets that kind of deal. It's the same thing. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, I don't know if you've been following uh, the, the jury trial, but I was wondering what do you think the outcome is going to be for Michael Jackson's doctor and the evidence? Okay, the Michael Jackson trial, where his doctor is accused of negligent homicide in the way he handled or didn't handle the administration of uh, sedatives or anesthesia, anesthetics to help Jackson sleep. I'm guessing, and here you might as well flip a coin, I'm guessing they'll find the doctor guilty. Mm -hmm. Whether it will stand up on appeal, I don't know, but anytime a popular figure like Jackson dies, you've got a handy scapegoat, especially one who has four current girlfriends <laughs> show up to testify against him. You're probably going to get a guilty verdict. Uh, I would say as a strict matter of law from the little bit I have heard, the jury should probably find not guilty simply because, from what I've heard, there is enough of a chance that Jackson was able to give himself the dosage of the drug that killed him to raise a reasonable doubt. But that's just a guess. They came out today, there was a doctor on the stand today that said for the two minutes that he was gone, it wouldn't be practical for him to be able to I do it. I said it wouldn't be practical. He didn't say it would be impossible. And if you've been hanging around with drugs as long as Michael Jackson <laughs> has, he's probably a whole lot sneakier about slipping a hypodermic into that IV valve than you would give him credit for. He could probably do it faster than that doctor could. And remember, okay. that doctor was testifying opinion, not fact. So, as I say, I don't know. We're running a little far afield. Anything last one minute about Occupy Houston? Yeah, uh, definitely, Professor. Um, I urge... Um uh, fellow Houstonians, all the folks that live in South Texas, uh, to visit our website, OccupyHouston.org. Uh, come down to the reflecting, fuel, uh, the reflecting pool in front of City Hall. Come to Herman Square. Uh, join, observe our movement. Uh, bring the kids, of, too. Be, be a part of the change. Be a part of the change, uh, definitely. We, we're... Um, uh, we're okay. It's... The people's government in action. Even if you don't want to take part, at least see what's happening. Mm -hmm. And we have had an exciting, busy evening tonight. We've hit kind of all over the board, but that's fine too because we want you to be involved with what's going on. And remember, it's your government whether you go down and join Occupy Houston, be sure and write your representatives and let them know what you think. <laughs> or, and we will see you again in two weeks. to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. Damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do, is end the war on drugs.